Hi, my name is Sanjoy Roy and today we're going to talk about the impact of cultural festivals. The examples I'm going to show you are perhaps three. I'm going to talk about the Jaipur Literature Festival, which is an annual program that happens in the city of Jaipur, but today has also expanded across the world. I'm going to give you an example of what happened in South Africa, and I'm going to touch upon examples in both the United States as well as in Australia. For many of you, you probably know that the Jaipur Literature Festival, which has grown to be among the largest in the world with half a million people who come through our doors every year and over a million people who view episodes online. Uh, the festival was set up primarily as a way to be able to uh, restore and preserve built heritage in the city of Jaipur. As you know, in most old cities, people tear down their old habedis or buildings or shops, and they give way to malls, to new offices, to uh, restaurants, etc. So two people, John and Faith Singh, who had seen some of the work that we've been doing in Edinburgh, uh, where the arts comes together with built heritage to be able to create value for the people in that city. They were very keen to do that in Jaipur itself, and which is the reason they reached out to us and said that, how do we do this in Jaipur? Uh, it resulted in the creation of the Jaipur Virasat Heritage Festival, which ran for a few years, and that was a multi-arts festival, music, theatre, oh. dance, literature, film, food, all kinds. But unfortunately, that festival wasn't able to sustain, and as it started getting into financial difficulties, they reached out again to say, you know, can you come and rescue the festival? We anyway were producing little bits and pieces in the earlier festival, so what we decided to do was that the literature segment, which was being curated by Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple in the Jaipur Virasat Festival, we took that, it was a very small part of this larger festival that they did, we took that and we created what is now seen to be the Jaipur Literature Festival. We set it in the historic premises of Digi Palace. And in those days, Digi Palace was really, it started as a hostelry, a few rooms uh, with a few beds that you could rent at about 750 rupees, etc., for backpackers. Today, of course, they have over 150 rooms. They sell their rooms at an average uh, on season price of about seven and a half thousand, and during the festival, much more. And it's really become one of the most distinguished properties of Palace Haveli or heritage properties in the city. What the festival did to Jaipur was really created an atmosphere, a place where everybody could come. When we started it 13 years ago, I remember on a cold winter morning, our thought was that, would anybody come at all? And as I got to uh, the Digi Palace, the bar hall, I remember telling my colleagues, you know, there was about 250 chairs inside the room. I said, 250 people will come, chairs to remove Remove 100 chairs, uh, you know, so that it looks full. How did we know that people would come and they came from uh, not just uh, Jaipur and Delhi, but across the world? And that year, over the three days that the festival was held, we had about five, 6,000 people who came through uh, to view the sessions, to participate, to enjoy the hospitality. The next year, these people brought their friends. So 5,000, 6,000 grew to 10, 12,000, and the year after that to 24, and then by the fourth year, about 50,000, and then in the fifth year onwards, it went straight to um, 80,000, 100,000, 120,000 to what it is today, half a million people. The advantage that we had when we started the festival is that uh, um, our organization already had, come, uh, had, uh, uh, had offices in different parts of the world. We had offices in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in, in Australia, um, in Egypt, in the United Kingdom, in Europe, in America, and we were able to get the word out about the festival in a way that attracted people very quickly. And so we were able to bring people in, we were able to bring journalists in who wrote about it, and then by about the fifth year, I think, or the fourth year maybe, we had the occasion where Salman Rushdie was planning to come and unfortunately couldn't do that and that made the world papers. At the same time, I received an email from Oprah Winfrey's office saying, 
would we consider, would the festival consider inviting her to Jaipur? And of course, you know, I could have said anything, but I said yes, we would be more than delighted. And Oprah's sort of arriving at the festival then created a huge added impetus for people to view it outside of India and across the world. So what is the impact of a festival like this? A few years ago, we did a survey and we looked at the numbers of people coming in from outside into Jaipur. We looked at how many hotel rooms that people were using. We studied the shopping patterns of people and we picked five areas. We picked uh, jewelry, we picked uh, furniture and furnishing, furnishings. We picked um, uh, clothes and textiles. Um, we, and we also picked pottery because Jaipur is famous uh, for blue pottery. And we, of course, we also then tracked uh, how people ate in restaurants, uh, the parties that were being he held, and of course, our own contribution to the local economy. Over the years, that contribution from a few crores of additional income into Jaipur today has grown to at least 120 to 150 crores. Similarly, if you remember the, the Durga Puja festival that happens in Bengal, contributes the highest amount of GDP to Bengal's uh, to Bengal every year and uh, that amount is pegged at over 500 crores of spend into Bengal's uh, economy which is which is huge when you look at any festival the impact is at many levels one is tangible as I've mentioned you know tourism hotel rooms, food, hospitality, and then is the intangible. In our case, the intangible is training. Every year, 4,000 people who provide services to the Jaipur Literature Festival are trained by our colleagues. It's a long process which starts in September of every year. People have to register to volunteer at the Jaipur Literature Festival. They are, their their uh, submissions are first read. Uh, those are shortlisted. We then look at interviewing them online. They then have to come from an uh, in person, face to face interview, and then they have to train for a weekend. So you're building capacity in the city. A small example of that is the Ishara International Puppet Festival uh, that we do in Delhi every year. When we started the festival 17 years ago, Contemporary puppetry was restricted to basically Dadi Padamji and the Ishara Puppet Theatre. And Katkatha, to some extent, had just started emerging, Anurupa Roy just started emerging. Today, Ishara Puppet Theatre Festival, which is annual, has led to many companies in Delhi and the hinterland. It's led to young people coming to train in the form of puppetry, creating new work, looking at advertising, social commentary, communication, uh, stories, and of course, using traditional means of both shadow and string to be able to create wonderful new imagery, which again opens your mind. It serves tens of thousands of children who we reach out to, not just in Delhi and NCR, but in Pune and Calcutta and Bombay and Bangalore and so many other cities. So you're opening minds and you're giving people an opportunity to see how best, what are the other ways that you can use communication. And as we know, one of the most important things about arts that's intangible is that it creates wealth, of course, like I said, in the way that banks do creates physical wealth, but it also creates intellectual wealth and heft. It opens your mind. It gives you a sense of what another world is about. It takes you across different universes. It, it allows you to experience different forms and different stories. And it allows you, perhaps most importantly, to come to your own truth, to your own idea of what you wish to do, what you think, what you believe in. There is no one truth as we know. If six people are in a room viewing a particular incident, whatever the incident may be, six people will go away with six different interpretations of that particular incident. 
and what the arts treat you, uh, teaches you is that each of those incidents and each of those truths are, are fact for that person. So there's nothing that's right or necessarily wrong. The other thing that we looked at, and I'm going to move to the next example, um, to Australia. One of the problems that Australia had was that uh, while the abortion of the native population uh, is only 2% of Australia's larger population, the prison uh, population of Australia is made up of 98% of aboriginal people. So just remember, 2% is what they form of the whole population, but 98% of Australia's prison population is aboriginal. Huge problem. It was in the early 2000s that the then Minister of Interior of Western Australia uh, had heard some of the work that we had been doing with Salam Bala Trust using the arts, which I will come to in a bit. And he wanted to see how that could be used in reforming prisons in Australia. So I went down, understood the problem, roamed around the place, etc. And what we suggested was a very simple experiment. We said that, okay, in this community, a hundred kilometers from Kalgoorlie in Western Australia, Kalgoorlie is the, is the deepest open mine uh, in the world, uh, which can be seen from space as well. So from there in a hundred kilometer radius, there were 15 or 16 communities which had a hundred percent incidence of incarceration or of people going to prison. So you can imagine from cradle to grave, these people at some point of time were in prison. So what we did is we said we will do an arts, a physical arts project with them uh, in the place that they lived in. And we told them, you use material that you're familiar with, rocks and stones and sticks and shrubs and natural colors and dyes. And we said, we asked them to tell their stories of the mountains and the rivers, of the ancestors, of the stars, of the moon, of the sun. And what we told government was that in the six months that we would do this, we asked government to do three things. We said, record the whole process. So make sure that what is the incidence of prison population before till after. We said, send the supermarket van into the community every week, along with the dole truck. You know, they used to get money every week to survive because they get social security. What used to happen earlier that they used to use the social to pick up the social security. They used to come to uh, the closest town where they went to the town. They picked up their money, went to the bar, went to the supermarket, went and did you know other things, and then invariably got into a fight and landed up at the police station, which was at the end of the street. So we said, if you bring the dole van out and the supermarket van out to the community, they won't have to come into town. And it was incredible. Six months later, as the project unfolded, and it was absolutely amazing what they did in a hundred kilometer radius. Of course, you could only see it from a helicopter. But the incidence level of that community that was incarcerated fell from 100% to 17%, which was amazing. Similarly, in Delhi, in, we have an organization called Salam Bala Trust, which I also set up 32 years ago, where we work with street and working kids. These are kids who run away from home because of physical abuse, mental abuse, or extreme poverty. And they come to big cities like Delhi or Bombay or Calcutta or uh, Bangalore or wherever. And um, of course, they have to fend for themselves. So what the trust does is basically provides them an opportunity, provides them education, a place to stay, a place to sleep, a place to be able to uh, train, and most importantly, a place where they can realize, like you and I have, a childhood and a place to dream safely outside of abuse. And we use the arts for it. We use the arts, music, theater, dance, literature, film, design, all of this to be as therapy for these young people to be able to realize their talent. And I'll give you two examples. So there was Salim, a young lad, uh, he was going in a Muharram procession in the old city of Delhi. And at some point of time, he sat down and the procession went over him and he was three years old and kept crying. And the police brought him to us 
and he just wanted to go home, Shota Salim. And uh, we had no way of figuring out, he didn't know his address, he didn't know how to write. So our art therapy teacher said, why don't you draw what you remember of where your house is after a while. And he drew his house at the place near a railway track, a little juggi or a little hut near a railway track and next to a church, a Girja Ghar, which he symbolized with a cross. So we knew that his house was in a slum development area, perhaps near a church and near a railway track. So we kept sending out his photograph over 10 years. 10 years later, we found his family. He was restored. Chota Salim, using the arts, went on to becoming one of the youngest actors from India to act in the Oscar-nominated short film, The Little Terrorist by Ashwin Kumar. And today, he is a very successful young person. Similarly like that, Vicky Roy, Harun, Sanjay, these are, you know, incredibly talented young people. So Harun and Vicky separately at two different points of time came up to me and said, you know, Bhaiya, we've done a photography course. Aake um, hamara exhibition inaugurate karo. And I said, exhibition inaugurate karo? Ye kaise ho sakta hai? What exhibition? Why didn't you ask me? Why didn't you ask us for help? And Harun said, mujhe ghar se paise nahi lena ka bhaiya. And, and um, Vicky said the same thing. Haran had gone to India Habitat Center, got them to uh, give him the uh, visual arts gallery, free of cost. He went to Raghurai, the world's leading photographer, asked him to curate the exhibition. And he went to the Norwegian embassy and said, will you sponsor this exhibition? And which they did. I went to the exhibition thinking, you know, I'll have to buy whatever number of paintings, etc., the photographs. And by the end of the day, I realized all his photographs sold out. He got a, a job from Times of India, which he joined. He lasted in that job uh, for six weeks. And he said, Bhaiya, I'm leaving because I'm so dead. And then he won the award, the All India Photography Award for a lakh of rupees. And he won the World Photography Project, which got him to Amsterdam to study, to create a project on street life in Amsterdam. Vicky Roy was one of four young people who was selected by the Maybach Foundation and Silverstein Properties uh, for a program where he recorded the rebuilding of the World Trade Center. And you can Google Vicky Roy and you can hear his TED Talks and, and his work today sits in museums across the world. Look at the difference it's made in their lives. And these are intangible because it doesn't necessarily have a value. It's an intangible reality. I'm going to leave you with two short uh, um, examples now. And one is in South Africa. South Africa had heard what we've been doing in this world of making a difference and how uh, festivals impact areas and localities. As you know, in South Africa, uh, when they won independence from the apartheid regime, uh, South Africa opened up, its economy opened up, its borders opened up, and it was the most successful and prosperous economy in Africa. People came from across Africa to South, to South Africa. They just poured in, and they poured in to Johannesburg uh, and to Newtown, the central business district, which had the bus station. And they all got out and they didn't know what to do, and they lived there. And South Africa, South Africans had, you know, they came with their weapons and guns and machetes, and it became a lawless place and everybody who lived in the CBD moved out to a new area called Santon. So in 2003-2004, the South African government with our then um, uh, Consul General Navdeep Suri approached us to say, how can we change the narrative in this particular uh, district in Newtown? So what we said, I went there and when Navdeep Suri called me, I said, uh, Ambassador, you know, I don't know South Africa at all. I know it's a place that's very difficult. I know there's no direct flight, there's no flatbed. I'm not coming there. So he said, give me one day, just come for a day. So I flew in there, he had fixed up all of these meetings. We went and met the city, toured Newtown, and all we said to the city was that, uh, Stephen Sachs, the city manager, we said, you should assure three things. 
delineate an art district in Newtown. Provide excellent lighting and provide excellent policing. I said in three years time, I will walk across Mary Fitzgerald Square with my phone in my hand and I won't get mugged. Three years later, that's exactly what happened. Today, that particular district in Newtown has got galleries, museums, they've converted the old powerhouse into uh, a conference center, it's got uh, music spaces, it's got restaurants, it's got new developments. Again, look at the kind of transformation that has happened in that, in that city in such a short period of time. And the last uh, example I'm going to leave you with is Egypt. In the coming of the Arab Spring, as you know, Egypt depends entirely, 80% of its economy depends on tourism. And tourism had stopped because of Arab Spring, people had stopped flying into Egypt. And again, the same ambassador of the Suri had gone to Egypt. He and the Egyptian government reached out to us and said, what can we do to be able to show that Egypt is safe? So we went there and we thought about it. And for me, you know, going to Egypt was like a bucket list kind of stuff, right? Anybody would, would rush there, very different from going to South Africa. Amazing, amazing place. And we decided that we would start the festival in the airport in Cairo. Why? So that people across the world realized that the airport was a safe place for us to come to. And that's what we did and CNN and BBC and TV New Asia and everybody sort of beamed it up and showed how successful this program was. That festival now continues. It's been hugely successful. And these are examples I've basically given you to show that how the arts and festivals impact cities, can impact nations, can transform mindsets, can bring about communication and can build trust, faith and benefit people at every level. Today in Jaipur, from the person who sells Moomfali to the person who brings his puppets to sell on the street, to the person selling popcorn, to the old city, the pink city bazaars around Hava Mahal, to the fancy stores, the Amrapalis and the Golchas and the Gem Palaces, the Rambans of the hood of, of Jaipur uh, to the smaller Oyos and um, other smaller establishments, Airbnbs, everybody benefits from the festival. Everybody stands to gain. I hope you've enjoyed the session. I look forward to coming back to you with new thoughts and ideas.